get started. So I want to welcome everyone to um, this presentation of Achieving Independence Through Supported Decision Making. Uh, my name is Jennifer Feinstein, and I'm a case manager in the Daniel Jordan Fiddle Foundation Transition and Adult Programs at UMNSU CARD. Um, I am really excited to have this wonderful speaker today. We're going to be listening to Viviana Bonilla Lopez, who is an Equal Justice Works Fellow sponsored by the Florida Bar Foundation, and she's an attorney at Disability Rights Florida, and is really spearheading the movement to have supported decision making um, on the books legally as a, an option for us here in the state of Florida, and she's going to tell us more about that. Um, I would just like a little housekeeping. If you have questions as Viviana is talking, you can please utilize the chat function here uh, and then she will be able to address them as we're going. And at the end, if we do have some time, uh, we will stop recording and then we'll take live questions. But during the recorded portion, we're not gonna be doing live questions. So um, again, welcome everyone and um, go ahead Viviana, take it away. Thank you so much. It's really lovely to be here with all of you all. As Jennifer said, my name is Viviana. I work at Disability Rights Florida, and it's my pleasure and honor to work with people with disabilities and their families to find alternatives to guardianship. So we represent people with disabilities in the state of Florida. I work at an organization that is the Protection and Advocacy Agency for the state of Florida. That means that we receive federal funds to represent people with disabilities. And we handle cases where a person with a disability is facing some sort of legal issue because of their disability. And one of our priorities is to promote supported decision-making so that people with disabilities can keep their rights. So what is supported decision-making? We all make tons of decisions every day. Some of them are small decisions, like whether or not you should buy that cool new video game or order pizza. Others are bigger, like deciding what kind of career you want, where you want to live, or who to vote for in an election. Everyone has the right to make decisions. Sometimes we need help with those decisions. If you're a young person or an older adult with a disability, your family, medical service provider, or someone else may ask a judge if they can become your guardian and make all of your decisions for you. This is a legal arrangement called full guardianship. Your parent or guardian might think they have to get guardianship to do things like attend IEP meetings or help you make financial decisions, but that's not true. There are other ways that people can help you make choices. For example, a healthcare proxy only helps make healthcare choices, and a social security representative payee only helps make financial choices. But another option to control decision making. lays out a plan for you to meet with a person or group of people you trust. These people can be family members, friends, co-workers, or others who can help you make decisions. You pick the decisions you might need help with, who can help, and how. Your group of supporters might look through information with you and talk through the pros and cons of different choices. They might talk with you about eating healthy foods or ways to keep track of appointments. Want to choose a college, vote in elections, or change jobs? What about date, get married, or start a family? With supported decision-making, you are the decision-maker. With guardianship, the guardian is the decision-maker and makes all the final decisions. Some decisions are big, some are small, and all of them are important. Making your own choices can help you lead a happier, healthier life. If you are a person with a disability, and feel like you need help making decisions, know that you have options. You have the right to decide. For more information on supported decision-making in contact at... Oh, <laughs> we all make tons of... Right over again. So that is a good introduction to supported decision-making. I hope everyone was able to see that. I know we had a little bit of trouble with audio, 
but I'm still gonna fill in some of the blanks. So supportive decision-making is an alternative to guardianship. And I think to really understand it, we have to understand what guardianship is. So what is guardianship? Guardianship is a legal process, like the video said, where the judge can decide that a person can't make their own decisions and doesn't have the capacity to make their own decisions. If that happens, then they can have a guardian appointed. And a guardian is someone who makes decisions for you and has your rights if they're taken away from you. So you can see in this picture that we have a person under guardianship, they're legally called a ward, but we don't like that term. And they have the red X, right? Because they've lost their rights. And then we have the guardian with the green check mark because the guardian now has their rights. So they make decisions for that person. And what are the rights that you can lose under supported, sorry, under guardianship? You can lose the right to get married, to vote, to personally apply for government benefits, to have a driver license, to travel, to work, to contract, to sue and defend lawsuits, to decide where you live, to manage property, and to decide who your friends are and who you spend time with. And if you really think about all of these rights, how we exercise these rights and how we decide what we're going to do is what makes us who we are. This is what makes our life meaningful. So it's a really big deal to take this away from someone and we only wanna do it when we're absolutely sure that there is nothing else that's going to work. So what is guardian advocacy? In Florida, we have an additional procedure for taking away someone's rights and giving them to someone else called guardian advocacy. It's pretty similar to guardianship. The outcome is essentially the same. The only difference is in who it's for and what the process is like. So it's only for people with developmental disabilities and the difference is that instead of asking, does the person have the capacity to exercise their rights? And if no, should a guardian be appointed? The question is, does the person have a developmental disability that makes it so they can't make their own decisions? The process is a little bit different too. For guardianship, when someone is um, alleged to be incapacitated, they are evaluated by three experts who determine whether or not they have capacity. And then the judge based on that and other information makes a determination. With guardian advocacy, there's never that determination about incapacity. So there's not three evaluations. Instead, the decision is made based on documents. So it could be based on IEPs or other documents that show that the person has a developmental disability. So for guardianship, there's these two steps, capacity, then guardian, and for guardian advocate, it's just, uh, does the person have a developmental disability and need someone to make decisions for them? So there's less due process protections involved in guardian advocacy, and due process protection is just kind of a fancy way of saying that if you're gonna take away my rights, we have to be sure that it's the right thing, and so I deserve the right to be heard, and there has to be these mechanisms in place to make sure that we're doing the right thing. There have to be these kind of stop and, and decide if this is right moments. We call that due process. And there is less of that involved in guardian advocacy, even though a guardian and a guardian advocate have the exact same obligations, responsibilities, and powers. And in fact, guardian advocates have to submit the same reports and are guided by um, section 744, which is the guardianship statute once the guardian advocacy is in place. So let me see if we have any questions. Perfect. Okay, so Jennifer tells me that we have in the audience, we have parents, we have adults with disabilities, and we also have professionals. And so I'm really excited that we have a really good mix of people here. So frequently asked questions. Some of these questions are posed from the point of view of parents because I get a lot of questions from parents, but this presentation is for everyone. And so please ask questions and we'll gonna tailor the discussion to everybody. So the first question that I get often from parents is, my child is about to turn 18. Don't I need to become their legal guardian in order to stay involved in their life? And the answer to that question is no. After your child turns 18 and they become an adult, they're no longer a child, 
there are a lot of ways outside of guardianship to stay involved. And so this applies if you are a young adult or you're a teenager and you're soon to turn 18, there's a lot of ways that your parents or other supporters that you may have like friends or grandparents, other caregivers can stay involved. So the first is supported decision-making. Obviously that's our favorite. You already got a preview as to what that's like in the video. The next is a power of attorney. So some of these tools that I'm gonna discuss can be used alongside supported decision-making or they can be used on their own. And the first one is power of attorney. A power of attorney is a legal document where a principal, who's the person who actually signs the documents and gives away the power, kind of photocopies their rights and shares them with someone else who we call an agent. So for example, if I'm a principal and I sign a power of attorney saying my mom can deposit money into my bank account and she can withdraw money in my bank account, I'm sharing those rights with her. And I can do that through a power of attorney. And I can share a lot of different rights through a power of attorney. I could allow someone to represent me in a lawsuit. I could allow someone to sell my home for me. The next example is healthcare surrogate. So this tool allows me to appoint someone to make healthcare decisions for me. And that person can make healthcare decisions for me either now or at a later time. And they also could decide whether or not I donate my organs. And the interesting thing with both of these tools is that because I still have my rights, I can take away the powers that I've given to someone else at any moment. So I could have a healthcare surrogate for two or three years and then decide I don't need one anymore and take it back which is different from guardianship, which you can't take back without going to court. So advanced directives are documents where I say what I want to happen to me for medical decisions. So for example, if I have a mental health disability and I am thinking about the next time that I may have psychosis, I could say, okay, if I'm at the hospital for mental health treatment, these are the medications that work for me these are the treatments that I'm not comfortable with. And it helps guide people for when I'm not able to say what I want. Information releases are documents where I give someone else permission to access my information. So an example would be a FERPA release, which is a release where I would be sharing information that is protected under a federal law that protects my education records or a HIPAA release, which is where I would share information that is protected under a federal law that protects my healthcare documents. So these could allow someone to help me make decisions. For example, if I give my aunt a HIPAA release and in that release I say my aunt can talk to my doctors and my aunt can see my medical records, this information could allow my aunt to give me advice when I'm making medical decisions. So all of these documents together can also be used as part of supported decision-making if you start to see where we're going. The last one is representative payee. And a representative payee is someone who receives my social security money and makes sure that my rent is paid and that my basic necessities are met. And then either gives me the rest of the money or saves it for me. So it's someone who helps me manage my social security benefits. And if I have a representative payee, and all I receive is social security money, this is a very non-restrictive way of making sure that my money is going to be safe without taking away my right to manage my own finances. So how can all of these things work together and what exactly is supported decision-making and how does it relate to everything else I just talked about? So supported decision-making, like you saw in the video, is a mechanism where people who I trust help me make my decisions. If you've ever asked someone for advice, you have used supported decision-making. I use supported decision-making every time that I have to make decisions about my car. I do not know anything about mechanics. And when I go to the mechanic, I have no idea if what they've told me is right, if it's a good price. So I ask other people for advice to make sure that I can make a good decision. And supported decision-making is just that. We can formalize it in something called a supported decision-making agreement, which is a written document where I say, who's gonna help me make decisions and how. And what we do with supported decision-making is that the person with the disability who's making the decisions is called the decision maker and the people who give them advice are called the supporters. So you can see in this little graph that maybe I am a decision maker and I've decided to use supported decision-making along with a power of attorney. And 
As you can see, the person on my right, I have shared my rights with them because I gave them a power of attorney. And that was my mom so that she can deposit and withdraw from my bank account. So I have the green check mark and so does she because we both have access to my rights. But then on the left is my aunt who I told you guys is getting a HIPAA release so she can talk to my doctor. So I'm sharing information with her, but not my rights. She can't make any healthcare decisions for me. So she's got that red check mark. So this is an example of how it might work. And to make it even more clear, I'm gonna share the fa my favorite supported decision-making story. This picture you see here is the picture of Michael Lincoln. He is a supported decision-making pioneer and he's a colleague of mine. We work together in a coalition that Jennifer belongs to where we're trying to get a supported decision-making law passed in Florida. So the, he was the first person in Florida to get out of a guardianship using supported decision-making. And I'm gonna give you an example of how he's used supported decision-making. So Michael is a security guard. And in order to decide what kind of career he wanted, he got advice from his supporters who helped him figure out what programs would be available to him, what kind of financial aid he could get, and then what kind of career he would want. Michael ended up passing his test. He's now a security guard at a hospital where he helps keep people safe, which is something that he's really passionate about. And another example is his new apartment. So recently Michael decided that he didn't want roommates anymore. It was time for him to live on his own. And he moved into his own apartment. His supporters, which include a friend and his uncle, helped him look over different options, neighborhoods where he might feel comfortable, what kind of things did he want in an apartment, go visit them, then read over the lease, decide what he could afford. And they helped him pick out an apartment, which he loves and is really nice. It has a pool, which Mike loves. So these are some examples of how someone could use supported decision-making to make their own decisions. And Mike is a great example because he's someone who the courts thought was incapacitated and said he can't do anything on his own. And now he's totally proving everybody wrong. And not just that, but he's making it so that everybody else can use supported decision-making because he's an amazing advocate. So this is also a great time to check on the question. So let me see in the chat box. We have one question that says, who decides the time that this power lasts? So this is probably about powers of attorney and healthcare surrogate designations. That's a great question. The person who decides is the person who gives the power. So that's the principal. And in this case, it would be the decision maker. So they decide how long it lasts. They could say, um, this power will last until I take it away, or they could say this power will last for a month or a week. It would depend on what they want to accomplish, but there's no court involved. And then someone says, congrats to him. Mike will love hearing that. So supported decision-making in the United States. We've been making a lot of strides and there have been a lot of successful cases in addition to Mike's. So these states, each one that has a star is a state where there's currently a supported decision-making law. And we are hoping to add a star to Florida. What supported decision-making laws do is they explain what is supported decision-making, who can be a decision-maker, who can be a supporter, how can that support be given. Oftentimes they provide a sample supported decision-making agreement and they sort of regulate how this is going to work in the state. So we're hoping to do that too. And our bill also, in addition to that, makes it so that judges would have to consider supported decision-making before they appointed a guardian or guardian advocate. So that would be really important because we would be able to catch people who don't need guardianship before that happens. And this is an example of a supported decision-making agreement. This one is very simple, but it gives you an idea of what they say. And as you can see here, it, it says, you know, what is the help that my supporters are going to give me? This is why I expect from my supporters. This is how I express myself. And these are the areas where the supporter is going to help me. A lot of supported decision-making agreements are more detailed than this. The ones that I work on with my clients usually are significantly more detailed where they say exactly what kind of support they want, areas where they don't want support at all. They may refer to other documents like a power of attorney if they have one. So it's really going to depend. I also have clients who have supported decision-making agreements that have pictures because they are visual and that's the way that they communicate. 
So it's really meant to be tailored to each person. And that is the most important thing about supported decision-making is each person, each decision maker decides how they are going to do it. Are they going to have a supported decision making agreement? What's it going to look like? Will they have powers of attorney? And it all has to work for them. So here's a question and I'm turning to the chat box. How can supported decision making prevent a bad decision? such as allowing someone to take financial advantage of the person and what guardrails are there? This is an excellent question that I actually am pretty sure I'm going to come to in a couple of slides. So I'm gonna leave you in suspense for a little bit, but I promise we have thought of that too. So question number two, don't guardianships provide you with control over what happens to your loved one? I love my son, I know him best, and I wanna protect him. And for those of you who are young adults and adults in the room, you know that this is what parents are like. You know, they love us, they wanna help us, but sometimes they can go a little overboard. So what's the right answer here? Guardianships give the courts ultimate control over your loved ones. So that's really important to know, is that guarding, being a guardian is different from being a parent, right? When you are under the age of 18, your parents get to make decisions for you, right? Because you're not old enough, you haven't learned enough about life. When you're under guardianship, the court is really the person who's in charge of you and the court appoints a guardian to kind of do that work for them. But if the court isn't happy with how the guardian is doing it, the court can remove it. And the guardian has to be accountable to the court for how they're doing that job. They have to say, listen, this is what I've done this year. And that's an annual report with the person under guardianship. Do you think I did a good job, court? I mean, it's it's not exactly like that, right? It's, it's a legal process, but that's kind of the idea. And we do this because taking away someone's rights and giving them to someone else is a pretty big deal and it makes someone pretty vulnerable. So we want to make sure that the guardian is doing what they're supposed to. So it's different from being a parent. It's really a relationship between the person and the court and the guardian is there to act on behalf of the court in a way. A judge decides who the guardian is. Usually the petitioner, like a family member will be appointed if they're the ones who ask to be a guardian. But some of this will also depend on whether they qualify. So for example, um, if a person has a criminal history or a certain history with DCF, they may not get to be the guardian and that's not always fair, right? There are some communities that are over-policed and over-investigated by DCF, but these are some things to think about if you are considering trying to be appointed as a guardian. Before you go through that, you should find out if you're eligible and if it's likely that you would be appointed because if not, um, a professional guardian could be appointed and that, that could be a stranger to the person under guardianship. And then, of course, the, one of the biggest things that people don't realize is that if the person under guardianship has lost the right to travel, you need to ask the court for permission every time you leave the county. So if I'm a person under guardianship and I don't have the right to travel and my mom is my guardian, every time that we want to go to the beach in Fort Lauderdale, we need to ask the court for permission because my guardian is taking me out of the county and I don't have the right to travel. And this is important, right? Because not all guardians um, are, could, are gonna be people who do things right. And so we wanna make sure that we are sort of safeguarding against people who would wanna take advantage of this situation. Question number three, I want my daughter to be independent, but she's not ready now. Can I get a guardianship and then reverse it when my daughter is ready? So again, the young adults and the adults in the room could relate to this, right? Sometimes our parents think we're not ready. We think we are. And I think the, the main point here is that it's hard to get out of a guardianship. It's much easier to try less restrictive alternatives first. And so we always want to do that. We want to move from less restrictive to more restrictive. So we want to lose, we want to move from things where we have the most rights. We want to try those first to things where we don't have our rights or we've lost them. Supported decision-making is a less restrictive alternative. It's a way for me to keep my rights and make my own decisions with help. If that doesn't work, then we can move to trying something else. Maybe representative payee, where someone else is taking care of my money. 
And then if that doesn't work and if nothing else works, like a power of attorney or some other document, then we try guardianship. But I think a lot of the times we expect people with disabilities to be perfect. And that is not fair because nobody is perfect. Most 18 year olds are not ready to be adults, right? Uh, that is a time where you start to make mistakes and learn from them. And people with disabilities have the same right to do that. So especially with people who are around age, who are pretty young, we really want to try other things first because they're still learning new skills. And we all remember what that was like. So here is the concept of the dignity of risk. And now I will get to that question that someone asked me about what happens if someone is making bad decisions or wants to make dangerous decisions. So the idea of the dignity of risk is that people with disabilities have the right to make mistakes. Everyone has the right to make mistakes. And we cannot hold people with disabilities to a higher standard. We can't expect them to be perfect in order to have their rights. So I have the right to make mistakes and I can learn from my mistakes. So our young adults and adults in the room, you have the right to make mistakes. And I like giving an example of how, you know, we all know someone who was up too late, was a little stressed and made some purchases on Amazon that they shouldn't have, right? And if they're at a party and they're telling that story, they're like, man, I went on Amazon yesterday, I spent like $200, can't believe I did that. We all think, oh, that's pretty funny. But if someone with a disability does it, sometimes people might say, oh, well, that's because they can't manage their finances or, you know, that's because they're not ready. That means that, that they can't do it. They need a guardian. Is that really fair, right? We have to recognize that all kinds of people sign up for credit cards that they don't need. All kinds of people sign up for gym memberships that they don't need. Those are the two things that parents are always telling me they're worried about. And we need to allow people to make decisions and learn from them. And where supported decision-making comes in is that our supporters can help us to understand when something was a mistake, to work through the consequences, and to think of ways that we can change our conduct in the future. So if a person with a disability who's a decision maker wants to make a decision that their supporters disagree with, they'll have a conversation as to why that is. And then if it ends up being a mistake, then they'll have a conversation as to, well, why was that a mistake? Why was that a bad decision? And, and learn through that. So that really is a safeguard, is that relationship between the person with the disability and their supporters, between the decision maker and their supporters. Those are sort of the guardrails. And in terms of finances specifically, again, we can figure out what the best way is to manage those finances. So if someone, um, really needs that support, they could have a representative payee, but there are options. So for example, I could decide that I would like to manage the money that my ma I make at my job, but I would like my mom to be my trustee for any money that I may inherit in the future. Cause maybe it's a lot of money and that's a little intimidating for me to handle on my own. So there are a lot of different ways that we can make sure that someone has all of the support they need to make good decisions. We're realizing that making mistakes is part of life. Okay, so before we go to this video, I'm going to stop and answer some questions. So let's see. In what kinds of situations would a supported decision making agreement be more appropriate than a guardian advocacy? That's a great question. So I think you should always try supported decision making before guardian advocacy, period. Just give it a try, see how it works. And then if it doesn't, then try guardian advocacy. Again, guardian advocacy takes away the person's rights. And in order to get them back, you have to go to court. Going to court to get back your rights is difficult and it's expensive. Most people who are put under guardianship or guardian advocacy will die under guardianship or guardian advocacy because it's hard to get out of it. I would need to file with the court, then have to prove to the court that I actually am able to make my own decisions depending on whether it's guardianship or guardian advocacy, there is an evaluation. So it's a tough process and it's expensive. And if I have a professional guardian, I have to pay for my attorney and my guardian's attorney in case my guardian would like to oppose me in the litigation. So it's, it's always easier if we try from less restrictive to most restrictive. 
I'd say in particular, we want to be looking for people who are able to make their own decisions, who anybody who's really manifesting their wills, anybody who's saying, I want this, I don't want that. Anybody with an opinion should be using supported decision-making and that's pretty much anybody. So I think there's a lot of ways for us to work with people with disabilities. For example, I have some clients who are nonverbal and we use assisted and augmentative communication to work with them and figure out ways that they can express what their will is and what they do and don't want. And I'm happy to answer questions about specific instances um, if you all contact me and I'll share my contact at the end. So what responsibilities does a guardian have? So both guardians and guardian advocates basically are in charge of that person's life because they'll have, it'll depend on whatever rights are removed. So if it's a plenary guardianship, which means that all of the rights were removed, then they're in charge of everything in that person's life, their healthcare, their finances, making, um, deciding whether or not they can hang out with their friends, deciding where they live, paying their rent. I mean, anything that you would do for yourself, suddenly someone else has to do it for you. And with guardian advocacy, one of the other main differences between guardianship and guardian advocacy is that with guardian advocacy, we have to leave the person at least one right. And guardian advocacy can be just as restrictive as a plenary guardianship because, for example, if you only leave the person the right to vote, then they're basically under plenary guardianship, except you know they, they have the right to vote, which is super important, but not being able to decide where I live, who I see, is pretty restrictive. So the responsibilities will depend on the rights that they're managing. And in terms of their legal responsibilities, the statute states what it is that they're supposed to do. One of the big ones is the annual reports. They also have a responsibility to help the person regain capacity and get out of the guardianship if that's possible. That's a responsibility that is not always taken as seriously as it should be, but is important to note. So let's see, next question. Do I need a guardianship or supported decision-making as I also have a trust for my daughter? So you do not, um, all of these things can kind of operate independently. You do not need a guardianship in order to have a trust. A trust is a separate thing. So a trust is when there is property that is for a person, but another person manages it for them, right? So I could have a trust that is a money trust and my sister is my trustee and she decides how often I get money from that trust and when I get money from that trust. Or there could be, for example, an apartment that is held in trust. I'm the one who lives there, it's for me, but my sister is in charge of the apartment. She has to do the maintenance and you know she pays the rent, all of that. I guess if it's in a trust, she probably owns it. Uh, the trust owns it. But that's kind of the idea there is, I'm, is one person manages something for another person. And you do not need a guardianship to do a trust. Anyone can set up a trust for another person. So that's actually a really great alternative to guardianship. If, for example, I'm a parent and I know that I have a significant amount of money in life insurance that when I pass away, I would like to leave to my son who has a disability, but I'm worried that he won't be able to manage all of that money on his own, I can leave that money to a trust and then leave someone else in charge of that trust. And that person would decide, or I would decide, I would leave it written in the trust how that money is dispersed. So it could be done like, for example, there's a trust and um, the trustee gives the beneficiary $100 a month. It will depend on how it's all set up, but you don't need a guardianship to do that. And in fact, a guardianship would mean that if the guardian is the guardian of the property, then they manage all of that person's property, not just money in a trust, but also money that they get from social security or money that they get from their job. And there could be also times where the trustee and the guardian are different. It's really gonna depend, but they are independent, separate things. And we work out, you know, once there's a guardianship in place, the judge kind of decides how they could work together, but you don't need the guardianship. And a trust is a really good way to use supported decision-making. Let's see the last one. I heard that it was harder to get guardianship after the person turns 18, that it should always be done before that. So what if they're not ready at that age? Okay, so that's not true. <laughs> um, and actually you can only get guardianship once someone is 18 because when someone is under the age of 18, 
their parents are their legal guardians already. I mean, again, it's a different type of legal guardianship, but um, people below the age of 18 can't make their own decisions anyway. Someone else makes them for them. So only adults can be put under the type of guardianship that I'm talking about. There's, there's also legal guardianship of minors, but we're talking about guardianship for people who don't have capacity and that can only happen after the age of 18. Um, it's not harder to put someone under guardianship at the age of 19, 20, 41, 50, whenever it is that you have to kind of resort to that alternative, it realistically probably will not be that hard to do. Unfortunately, guardianships are done sort of reflexively. They're oftentimes done based on a stereotype about a disability. And oftentimes there's not enough information about alternatives. So I've actually seen people who I really didn't think should be under a guardianship be put under a guardianship because the system just isn't working the way we, we would like it to be. So it's realistically in Miami-Dade County in particular, it's not going to be hard to put someone under guardianship. And if someone needs it, it's, it's definitely going to be an alternative. So I, I wouldn't let anybody kind of scare you with that. I think sometimes there's a lot of misinformation and some, some scaring parents that happens, but that, that is false. It's not true. Using supported decision-making and less restrictive alternatives is not gonna make it so that guardianship is not available later on. So let me see, I don't have any more questions. I have a video that kind of summarizes everything that we've talked about in the presentation, but I would love to answer more questions for everyone and to continue talking about this. We could probably go into more depth about some of the things that we've covered. So I'll play the video and then I'll come back to see if we have more questions. What is supported decision making? A message from Disability Rights Texas. Hello, my name is Ricky Broussard and I'm at Disability Rights Texas. I'm here to talk to you today about supported decision making. Supported decision making is a way for people with disabilities to keep our rights and make our own choices with help from others instead of having a guardian who makes decisions for us. Guardianship. People say guardians make it easier, but once you have a guardian, that guardian has control over you. A guardian is decided by a judge and you do not have control over any important decisions that need to be made. It shouldn't be that way because it's it's about the individual's life. It's, it's not about their life. Under guardianship, you can lose the right to choose where you live, how you spend your money, who you spend your time with, and other important decisions. Supported decision making. Supported decision making. It's all about the individual. It helps us make the right decision for ourselves in our life. If you need help making decisions, choose someone that you trust. It doesn't have to be a family member. It could, it could be somebody at school you trust or somebody at work you trust. After you choose somebody to support you, you tell them what you need support on and how they can help you. Some of the things that your supporter can help you do is going to the grocery store or make medical decisions or with where you live or they could help over your finances. In my support team, I let everybody know, okay, this is what I need decisions on and this is, this is what I need you to help, help me with. After I hear the pros and cons of the, the decision, that's when I make the final decision on whatever whatever choice I make. We all need help to make decisions. We have to make decisions every day. Your rights should not be taken away just because you need help. To learn more, ask for the free book called Making My Own Choices. So this is a really great video that I think is a good summary for everything that we've been talking about. And Disability Rights Texas actually helped pass the supported decision-making law in Texas, and they were big pioneers. That's the first state in the United States that had a dis 
supported decision making law. So they're pretty great and we love um, using their resources when we can because they're awesome. And I think one thing to note now that I'm thinking about Disability Rights Texas and their supported decision making law is that even though we don't have a supported decision making law in Florida yet, that doesn't mean we can't already use supported decision making. I have plenty of clients who do it, both clients who are trying to get out of guardianship like Mike to use supported decision making and clients who've never been involved with the court and would like to use supported decision making. So again, what we do is that we sometimes rely on other legal documents in order to make sure that your supporter has any legal authority they need to help you make your decisions. But the, the really the big difference will be that once we have our supported decision making law is that for anybody who wants their supporter to help them communicate their decisions or to gather information for them, they'll only need their supported decision making agreement. They're not going to need any other documents. But for people who are going to want someone to be able to act on their behalf in certain moments, like make healthcare decisions or um, make deposits in their bank account, they may still need these other things like powers of attorney or healthcare surrogate. So in, in many ways, supported decision making will probably look pretty similar after the law, but we will have um, more structure, more guidance, and more people will know about it because the law is one of the ways that we say what we value as a society. And so we want to make sure that everybody knows that in Florida, we care about people keeping their rights and making their own decisions as long as they can, which is pretty much the way that the law was structured. If you read over the guardianship statute, there's a lot in there about alternatives and making sure that people who can are making their own decisions. So I call it five one. Let's go over here and see if we have any more questions. Let's see, let me pull up the chat. Okay. Oh, yes, we have a couple more questions. That is great. So can you speak more about supported decision-making and what kind of stuff they can help with? And what's the difference between a supported decision-making and just asking a friend for your opinion? That's a great question. So supported decision-making can be used for any area of my life where I need help. What I see most often is finances and healthcare because those are big areas where we might have to make some tough decisions. But I also have seen people use supported decision-making for things like education. So that's a good example. Uh, just like Mike, where his supporters helped him figure out what kind of career he might want. A supporter could help me look through different college options, apply for college, figure out my financial aid. A supporter can help me when I'm already in school to request a reasonable accommodation, to figure out what kind of accommodations I may need for a certain course. So really anytime that I could need help doing something or someone's advice, I can use supported decision-making. And the difference between supported decision-making and asking a friend for their opinion, there isn't really a difference, right? The difference is, is that some people are going to formalize that and put it into a supported decision-making agreement. And so maybe I wrote it down. And so it's called a supported decision-making agreement. But ultimately, it's that. I'm just asking for advice. So I would call asking my friend for an opinion supported decision-making. I'd also call working with my aunt, who is a power of attorney, and we have a supported decision-making agreement together, supported decision-making. But most of the time when we talk about it, we're, we're talking about supported decision-making agreements, right? A lot of people who use supported decision-making in this formal way, that's more than just asking for advice, will put it down in a document. And to give you kind of more information on that, Mike always, when we give this presentation together, talks about how the way he uses supported decision-making is like law enforcement. He is a security guard. So he kind of thinks of himself as like the top of the sheriff chain of command. And then his supporters are kind of like below him and give him their advice and tell him, you know, I think maybe you can do this or you can do that. But ultimately he's making the decision and he kind of has them as their advisors. I have another client who thinks of himself as the CEO and he thinks of his supporters as his assistants. And he calls upon them when he needs his assistants to do something to help him out. So there could also be someone who uses supported decision-making, but they 
make a call whenever they have a difficult decision, whereas there could be someone who meets with their supporters every week to go over the decisions that they have to make the next week and what they've done the week before. It's really going to depend on each person. And it's a process that is extremely open because everybody is different. So it's gonna be what works for them. And to give one more example, which I think is helpful, I have a client who has, instead of a supported decision-making agreement, she has a supported decision-making declaration. So she wrote all of the ways in which she wants to be supported and in what areas. So she wrote, you know, for school, I want my, my supporters to help me pick out my classes, to talk to me about reasonable accommodations that I might need. And that's the way that she wants to be supported. So she did that basically in every different realm where she wanted support. And then she, instead of signing an agreement, she just gave that to her family members and said, if you ever want to help me, this is how. <laughs> and whenever she wants help, she asks. So it's really going to depend on each person how they decide to do it. Here's the next one. I don't understand why a legal agreement is needed. This seems like giving advice. Again, it's not. It's really going to depend on the person. You're right on the money. Some people may not want a supported decision-making agreement or any other kind of legal document, and they're just going to do this informally. Other people may want that supported decision-making declaration where they were like, if you're going to help me, this is how you're going to do it, and I want you to understand how I want to be helped. There might be people who want that supported decision-making agreement because they want that commitment. They want their aunt to commit to helping them and sitting with them every week, and it's like, I'm an adult, you're an adult, we're going to make a commitment to each other, and that might be helpful. It's also helpful sometimes for young adults who want to set boundaries with their parents and they want to say, okay, you're helping me make my decisions, but you need to understand what my boundaries are and what things are okay and aren't okay. And putting that in writing can be very helpful. Where you will definitely need a legal document is if someone's acting on your behalf. So the only way for someone to make a medical decision for me is with a healthcare surrogate designation. The only way for someone to sell my house for me is with a legal uh, durable, sorry, not a, doesn't have to be durable, with a power of attorney. So it's going to depend again on what the person wants is what they need. And that's what I do with my clients. We do an intake, we talk about their goals, and we figure out what of all of this that's available to you will you need. When SGM passes in Florida, does that add a step in the process? Since it was said that individuals and families can start the process. I think I already sort of answered that, but let's go back to it, is um, the supported decision-making law is really just gonna help everyone know what supported decision-making is. It might uh, add restrictions and requirements about who can be a supporter, but it's pretty much going to be very similar. It's also gonna hopefully give guidance on what supported decision-making agreements should look like and what needs to be in them. So right now someone could have a supported decision-making agreement that they've made informally, but then when the law passes, they have to add a couple of things to it. So it's going to depend, but the process is going to be very similar. I mean, it's still going to be the same outlook of what works best for this person. Um, it looks like some people shared that question. I hope I answered it, but I'm happy to um, provide more information if that's helpful. How does SDM help people with disabilities such as myself looking for employment? So supported decision-making can be a super helpful tool as you're looking for a job. You could have people who you trust help you find jobs, help you fill out applications, help you prepare for the interview, help you figure out what you might wanna do. And your supporters there could be your family members. It could be a case manager. It could be someone who works at a nonprofit organization that helps people get jobs. It could be Jennifer if you're at the card center and you're attending the group for young adults who are interested in finding jobs. Who would be held accountable if the outcome of the decision is not the one expected? So all adults are accountable for their decisions and for the outcomes of those decisions. So if a decision maker makes a decision that doesn't turn out well, they are the ones who are accountable for it and they are the ones who have to deal with the consequences. So this involves everything from, you know, spending more money than you had and not being able to pay a bill and having to deal with that consequence to, you know, doing something that you weren't supposed to, maybe um, at school and having to deal with some disciplinary consequences. Adults have to be accountable for their decisions and that's no different with supported decision-making. But of course, 
someone else can, can help me and give me advice during that difficult time. Can that be used at the physical school or medical hospital or with law enforcement? So again, supported decision-making agreements right now because we don't have the law, I can't use a supported decision-making agreement to give a doctor permission to talk to my mom. I can't do that yet, not until we have the law. So instead, I would give them a HIPAA release that says you have permission to talk to my mom. And I may also want to share my supported decision-making agreement so the doctor can see how my mom's gonna give me advice with my healthcare. So we may wanna use both. I'm over the age of 18 and I'm already under a plenary guardianship. Is it still possible for me to get out of the guardianship so I can have my rights restored and transfer to supported decision-making? Yes. The, you know, I would have to know the specifics about your case in order to really know if it's gonna be a case that where the judge is probably gonna rule in your favor or what we would have to do, but there is a process, it's called a restoration of rights. And you basically have to prove to the judge that you can make your own decisions and how it is that you exercise your rights. And so if you're interested in this, please contact me. I'm about to share my contact information and I'd be happy to talk to you about your specific case. Is this a service to help adults with disabilities to become more independent? Yes, that's the whole goal is supported decision-making helps people be more independent, helps them make their own decisions with advice. Okay, let's see. Any more questions? Please put them in the chat box. I really wanna make sure that you all got all the information that you want. Okay, so in the meantime, I'm gonna tell you what else Disability Rights Florida can do for you. So it's up on the screen. I can help you with a supported decision-making agreement and other documents. This service is particularly for people who live in Miami-Dade County, but even if you're outside of Miami-Dade County, we are able to give you advice and send you resources. We're hoping to expand our services soon. Right now that's um, our pilot project is in Miami, but we're hoping that we're gonna expand outside of it. We can help you with terminating a guardianship in favor of SDM, like the person who asked us for their specific case. We can also do consultations about supported decision-making and guardianship and give you advice on what your options are so you can decide what's gonna be best. And all our services are free and confidential. So don't feel afraid to reach out to us, we can help. In addition to that, we also help with IEPs, with discrimination at work, at home or in school, accessing assistive technology, and so much more. If you're having a problem and that is based on your disability, please call us. We are happy to help. Up on the screen is my phone number and also Disability Rights Florida's phone number. So you want to call the numbers in orange if you want help with supported decision making. If it's anything else, you want to call the numbers in the red box. So let's see if we have any more questions. Okay, no more questions yet. It's 6.55, so we have five more minutes. I don't know, Jennifer, if you wanna do live questions or wait to see if anything else comes up. Okay, you know what? I think um, this is a great time. I'm gonna stop recording and um, maybe Viviana will stop sharing her screen so that we can have a gallery view if anyone has live questions for the next five minutes and otherwise we'll be done. So again, thanks everyone for coming. Um, and here we go.